Welcome to What Happened on Saturday with Marlon Kerner. My name is Josh Corbier. I am broadcasting from the shadow of Touchdown Jesus in my own basement. I am a former Bills coaching assistant and the star of the show, joined by Marlon Kerner, former Bills DB, and more importantly for this show, Ohio State captain. Marlon, how you doing? I'm good. You, you keep calling me a star, and I'm just going to keep saying I'm not a star. I'm not. Well, a star, the star of the show, star. the star of the show, at least. You know, we'll we'll work on general star, but for now, you're you're the star of our show. Uh, you know, we're going to be uh, we're thrilled to be joined by Notre Dame alum and current uh, Louisiana Ragin Cajun defensive backs coach Jeff Burse. Can't wait to talk to Jeff about his team now, yeah, coaching down in Louisiana, and then obviously about the gigantic showdown Saturday night that I know Marlon and I can't wait for the uh, Buckeyes visiting Notre Dame. Uh, but before we, yeah, I can't wait before we get to that figure, we go through uh, Marlon's key takeaways uh, from week three, kind of a slower week in college football, clearly some, some, some great games. And then if you were up at two in the morning, you got rewarded with the Colorado, Colorado state game, but Marlon, uh, maybe you could start with uh, one of your key takeaways and we'll go from there. All right. Well, you're right. It, it wasn't as crazy um, as a week, the week prior, um, or hopefully this week that's coming up. But I will say there was definitely some really good football played this past weekend. So if you're a college football fan, it seems like week in and week out, you're always treated to a treat. Um, and I love it. Uh, so I want to start out by doing a little honorable mention, um, just because I can't believe this is something that's never happened. But there was a walk off victory in the SEC on Saturday. And there was a 61-yard field goal that was kicked mm. by Missouri to knock off K-State. And it's the first time that a 61-plus-yard field goal was made um, to win a game uh, in walk-off fashion in SEC history. So if, you were, if you're were, if you a K-State fan, I'm sorry. If you're a Missouri fan, you got to watch it. But I couldn't believe that that hasn't happened, that, that something like that, that type of a field goal um, to end a game in that dramatic fashion was the first time that has ever happened in this conference history. So I wanted to start and just kind of give nod to that. Um, but when I think about that, we talked about our game of the week last week, and I was talking about that Florida-Tennessee matchup. And Florida rolled early. So mm -hmm. that was the first thing that I saw. I was trying to figure out how Tennessee being ranked uh, in the, in, at 11, I believe they were ranked 11 going into that game, how they were going to handle um, and if they could come into Florida, a place they hadn't won since 2003, we're talking about 10 victory, 10 straight losses at the swamp. If you watch the that that the Netflix special, you got to see what it was all about and what the atmosphere was. And they hate Tennessee there. And so, again, you're looking at I'm like, all right, can they come back and do it? Florida used a 20 point second quarter to just obliterate and take command of this game early. They never relinquished it. Uh, Travis Etienne's little brother, Trevor, went for a career high, 172 yards on 23 carries, and Florida cemented the victory, got back in the win column, and more importantly, took control in the SEC so they can kind of control their own destiny because they, they lost early to Utah, uh, but they looked pretty good. Their defense got after it on Saturday and really gave Tennessee all kind of fit. So that was like the first game and our game besides that Colorado game we'll talk about later uh, was one of sure. the games I was wanting to watch. Sure. So that reminds me, uh, you know, the Florida Tennessee game, I drove from Tampa. I was in a wedding this year and I drove from Tampa all the way home back to Buffalo with my wife and my sons. And we drove through Gainesville and it really, Gainesville's kind of in the middle of nowhere, and you can see why it's called the swamp. And uh, that that brought up a, a Twitter question that I asked you last week, and you said that you were going to share it on the podcast. And I assumed that the Tennessee bus ride into Florida was not pleasant, but maybe you could share <laughs> with us fun. your least favorite your least favorite bus ride uh, in college football. Okay, so I really didn't have too many crazy places that I didn't mind riding into. I think the craziest bus I have, I have two bus rides. Like as a professional. The Jets, as Mitch Morris kind of talked about his experience, like the Jets fans were just you always got the double fingers coming at you all the way in. Like that was kind of the thing. And I loved it. So I didn't mind that. But there was one crazy bus experience that I had as a player coming in. And I can't believe we just kept going. Uh, so I have to set this picture for you. You have to think of it because when when you're on the bus, it was our, our last few buses. I think there was one more bus coming. There's always like an early bus. Then there's a couple buses that go. Um, early, then it's like the last bus you can get. So I always like to go on that second bus. 
uh, and get to the stadium early and get in my routine. So I'm sitting there. The head coach is on the bus. I'm John Cooper, and I'm a few seats behind him. And I'm sitting on the left side uh, of the bus. Um, and so this is for reference so you can understand. So, you know, you've got the aisle. You've got seats on the left, seats on the right. I'm sitting on the left side, and I'm at a window. I'm just leaning up against the window, just looking out the window, going through my head of what's going to happen. And we always had a police escort. Uh, so when I think I mentioned in one of the earlier episodes that we always stayed downtown at the Hyde on Capitol Square. So we would stay down there for the night. We'd get up in the morning, have our breakfast. You go to your room. You relax for a little bit. And then you go down and catch your bus, depending on what time the game was. So I don't remember who we were going to go play. I just knew I had to get on the bus at a specific time. And we're driving and the escort's going. So you always had about three or four police officers riding, escorting you around. And so what they would do is there was always a cop that would go ahead and he would get on the street and block it off. So there'd be no cars that could come and pull out on you. And we were going down a one way street. We're kind of going, well, we were going down high street. And so there's a lot of ways you can turn out into high street. And so I'm sitting there looking at the cop and I'm just sitting there looking and we're raw. I mean, we're probably going 50, 55 miles an hour going down the street, moving. We're getting it. And then all of a sudden, for some reason, I'm just watching this cop that's a, that a couple streets up and I see him hop back on his bike and all of a sudden he pulls forward. And I'm like, why did he do that? And we got up where he was pulling forward at. And all of a sudden there's a car just flying right oh. at us. And this car comes out and the bus I'm looking, I'm like, oh my gosh, you're about to get in a car wreck. And we just smash a car, like literally smash in front of this car. The car spins out. It goes to the left. It spins around. The cop hops off his bike. He's pointing his finger and yelling. And we just kept going. Like, it was like a bump. Like, we hit a pothole. Uh, and, now, and I'm sitting there like, this is amazing. And we just kept going. And I got off the bus because the first thing I wanted to see was how did, how did this bus look? Not, a, not really a scratch. Wow. Like, there was a little bit of damage on the front um, that you could see. But really... I couldn't imagine the damage that was done to that vehicle because you could see we, we literally tore like the bumper off. We saw the car spin and go to the left. And I'm sitting there looking like, wow, this is kind of the crazy experience. We kept going. And, and they were like, do you want to stop? And, and Coach Cooper's like, nope, keep going. We got a game to go play. <laughs> nothing, to stops, about nothing, that later. <laughs> nothing stops the Buckeyes on the way to the stadium. Right? Absolutely. That's we great. had to go play. And we won the game. <laughs> we did win the game. So KC White was worried about it. We did win. Um, and it did not affect me at all. I didn't think about it at all. I didn't think about, oh, my gosh, I was just in a wreck on a, on a bus going to a football game. But just one that was one of the craziest bus rides I've ever had in my entire life. Like We literally smashed a car that pulled out in front of us and kept going. I, I could totally see like, John <laughs> Cooper just saying, nah, keep going. Like, let them figure it out. I mean, what are you going to do at that point, right? Like, if the bus is fine, you got to go. You got to go make kickoff. Bus is fine. We can keep going. How far was the bus ride from the hotel to the stadium? Probably about 10, 12 minutes, depending on uh, how much traffic was there. Uh, really, it was easy to get down High Street with the police escort. It was really coming through campus. And, and there's a lot of people there. You had to make people move so we can get we can pull in and come around where we wanted to go. But we always had enough uh, officers on motorcycles that really could stop that um, and get get traffic blocked off, make people move. But sometimes you might get a little bit. It might go a little slower just because it was a big game and, and fans were everywhere trying to tailgate and get in their prospective places to cheer us on. Cool. That's wow. That's better than I expected. That's a great, that's a great story. So, so Notre Dame for, for comparison, you know, they'll go to mass on campus and then they walk, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of college teams that seem to walk on campus, the tiger walk at LSU and, you know, Clemson kind of does the same thing. Was that, was your Ohio state kind of unique where you guys would take the bus, you know, from a local hotel to the stadium to, do you know, do a lot of teams stay like on campus the night before or do kind of like a, a walk through the fans to the stadium? I, th I think it's just different. Um, I think Ohio State does a little bit of a walk now. They do some different traditions now than when I was there. I think the thing was they wanted to make sure they kept us away uh, from any distractions. You just wanted to make sure you were focused. And so our coaching staff uh, and, and previous coaching staff felt the best way to do that was to take us off campus uh, and treat us kind of almost like a professional team put you in isolation. The only thing you can focus on is making sure that we're going to do our last minute checks. You're going to go to the right meeting rooms. You're going to get up um, and then get a great meal so that you don't have to worry about some of those things that if you stayed on campus, okay, who's going to be late? Who's going to break curfew? Uh, because everyone didn't live on campus. Everyone kind of lived in different places. If you're a freshman, you might've stayed in some dorms, freshman or sophomore, normally a junior or senior might have an apartment. Um, and so you could live wherever as long as you had transportation to get back and forth. So I think it was more of a way to make it easier to make sure you have the entire team located in the right 
places. Make sure everyone's doing what they're doing. You can account for it. Nobody's sneaking out going to parties because they knew they weren't going to play or anything like that. Uh, and so that's kind of how we always did ours. So I'm not sure what what other teams did. Uh, and it's funny because we we always talk about it, but we never ask those questions. Uh, when you get around yeah. it, we always talk about some of the games we played against or maybe some of the traditions like, hey, what's up with the bucket? Um, or what's up with the axe or things like that when you talk about Minnesota and some of those other teams. But we never really said, what do you do the night before every game? So I may have to ask some of my guys, like, what do you guys do? We'll, we'll ask we'll ask Jeff when he comes on what Notre Dame did. And, you know, in, in, in the NFL, clearly you remember that they block off the whole floor and there were literally two security guards sitting at the uh, the elevator. And I'll never forget, like, my first game on the road, I'm like, man, they got two security guards sitting at the elevator making sure nobody goes, you know, goes down. And Carl Mock grabs and goes, no, kid, that's make sure nobody comes up on this floor. We don't want anybody coming up, not the guys coming down. And I'm like, ah, that makes a lot more sense considering yeah. the scene that was in the lobby and all the uh, fans and, and groupies and, and, and select young women that you'd see from time to time down in the lobby. So it made a lot of sense that you wouldn't want people coming up more so than anybody coming down. Was it the same at Ohio State? Like, was the whole floor blocked off? Yeah, we had we had our floors. We had specific floors that we were on. Um, coaches, players stayed on certain floors, and you had security at the end of it. Uh, and that was it. You made sure you just did what you're supposed to do. Uh, we they took care of everything for us. They made it so easy. You didn't even have to order room service or anything like that. They always made sure they had enough food for you to take back up to your room. They let you know what time with everything was going to be breakfast, what time buses were leaving. You just needed to make sure you follow the itinerary. So it was always something that was really cool. Uh, and it was probably. As, as people say, when you know, what was it? What's different? It was probably the closest experience of being a professional athlete um, at a collegiate level. Um, so I can't imagine um, how similar it is. Well, I can't imagine how similar it is now just thinking about the NIL. And I know those are topics we'll talk about later on and just what guys do now and how they're handled and how they're taken care of. So it, it's definitely very similar. Uh, and so when I got to the NFL, that was very I was already used to that. So I was used to uh, we set a hotel. Uh, we go, you know, nobody comes up, nobody comes in. We're going to get food here. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. So I was already well versed and accustomed to that lifestyle just because that's what we did for the last four years in college. Um, that's a great that's a great like training for the NFL. Like I mean, that, that in absolutely. And itself is a service to you. So what uh, what was another takeaway that you had from uh, from Saturday? You know, this is the weekend of the almost upset. Right. And so when you think about it, Georgia struggled early against South Carolina before pulling away. I think that's the first time I've ever seen them look. Um, like they really couldn't figure it out for a while, but you always had the the mindset of it's Georgia uh, and it's South mm -hmm. Carolina. South Carolina is not going to beat them and they're going to figure out how to do it in the second half. And they, they definitely inserted their will in the second half. They were down 14, three at halftime. And then all of a sudden they came back out uh, just a team on fire. A team looked different. They were able to run the ball and impose their will and do some things. And, and they finally ended up winning 24 to 14, but definitely, almost an upset you look at fsu and boston college i mean you talk about florida state and what they were able to do early in the season and then boston college should have won that game there's no i way almost it, called that one buddy that there's was no my way that boston college should not have won that game i think if you take away the way i think they had a, rec a record 19 penalties on themselves yep. coach halfley who used to coach at the ohio state university uh, you know if he, if he could just get Ten, nine of those penalties back <laughs> like that yeah. would have made the difference in them winning the game i mean but again Nobody cares if you win or lose as long as you win. And Florida State will take that victory because it still puts them one step closer um, to what they want to do and which is win a division. Uh, and then we talk about Texas, Wyoming. I mean, it was not as close as the score says it was at the end. Texas struggled against Wyoming after having that big win against Alabama. Uh, and then they finally pulled away and, and made it look a lot worse than what it was. But that was almost an upset. Uh, had Wyoming been able to just kind of keep the pressure on and keep that score close, I would have loved to see how Texas handled that pressure. And then we talk about Alabama and USF. Like it was one of those games we were just texting back and forth. Like, what does this look like? I thought it was going to be a no-brainer, but we talked about it earlier, which goes into the second thing that I'll talk about. Or my third thing is Alabama struggling, uh, and they're struggling in two main areas that we normally don't see saving coach teams struggle in one their offensive line is just not as good as we've been accustomed to seeing our offensive line being as dominant in the past right like that's always been the key they could run the ball they open up gaping holes you don't see that teams get pressure on them and their quarterbacks seem like to have all day back there you know sometimes you might get some teams like a georgia or a clemson that matched up well with them so it was always a chess match of who could do what who did this who was better here but when we think about it that offensive line just doesn't look as sound uh, and they're going to be better um, as time goes on. So you just need experience sometimes. But then the other half of it is quarterback play. 
their quarterback play is just not good right now. And it's not that they don't have talented quarterbacks. That's not what I'm saying. It's because they don't have the experience. When you look at what they've had and the guys that have been, they mostly have quarterbacks that stay and that they, they're they going to be there for a while. They've been in the system. You know, even Jalen Hurts, who got them to the national championship game the year before and then decided to leave because Tua came in uh, and then Tua was there. And then you just you think about it, Mac Jones. Like, they've always had just a pipeline of talent coming in that has that's been around, that's been in games, that's watched games. Now you have quarterbacks that just don't have the experience. Uh, and Milrose gives them the best chance, and they benched him because of the Texas loss. And now they're going to go back to Mill Row. So that's something that we haven't seen. I mean, when you think about Alabama, they haven't been in the not, not ranked in the top 10 since 2015. The last time that happened, they actually also won a national championship. Um, they lost the game early and then they figured it out and came back and ran the table. So could this be another year where they figure it out and run the table and get to play for national championship? Time will tell. But in order for those things to happen, they're going to need to have better O-line play and better quarterback play. I think uh, we've got a special guest here who looks like he's in the sun, and we're going to bring him in now and change this up. My man, JB. What's happening? I didn't know I was supposed to be on video out of, out of, out of shades. Are you good? Oh, I mean, no, I no, no. You, that's right. No, you're in the throes of a football season. We'd really like to uh, welcome uh, Louisiana uh, coach Jeff Burris. Coming off a big win against UAB. Looks like it's beautiful weather down there. Uh, for our podcast here today, obviously he's a Notre Dame alum as well as a Buffalo Bill uh, alum as well. So I figure this is the perfect week to bring him in and talk some smack to my guy Marlon here. And uh, we can tell him why Notre Dame is going to uh, pull this one off. Jeff, how you doing? I am doing fantastic. I appreciate you guys having me on. Well, yeah, so I hopefully you appreciate days. my background uh, in my basement. I've got the big fat head of Touchdown Jesus that we broadcast from the shadow <laughs> of. And uh, <laughs> so I'm going to just, the... just point over my shoulder. Look, look, you know. Oh, yeah, there's well, yeah, never there too go. far from my heart. Never too far. <laughs> from my heart. <laughs> so so Jeff, uh, you know, you were you were generous enough with your time in the spring and came on the podcast with Don and I if the walls could talk in Buffalo. And, uh, you know, we were talking about your career and, and your journey. And, you know, you had mentioned being, you know, a coach at Louisiana. And we want to kind of catch up and know how the season's going so far for you guys. And you you play uh, you play Buffalo on Saturday. We do. That, how, how ironic that is. We, we actually play them on Saturday. Uh, it's, it's going well. We we started uh, – we're 2-1 and one currently right now in the season, um, you know, with uh, some some early injuries. But things are, things are going well. The, the team is starting to gel. Uh, I tell you what, th these guys, we have a group, uh, first and foremost, it starts with a head coach. Uh, Mike Desmo is a phenomenal head coach, and uh, our team just has bonded uh, early this early this year, and we continue to try, try to progress. And that's what it's, it's all about is making sure each week you get better, 1% uh, better every day. And uh, I think we, we're doing that. The guys work hard. Uh, it's hot down here. It's, it's 90 degrees still. So we have no choice but to be happy. And the sun's always out, it seems like. And the steam is, is <laughs> extra. It's really extra right now. Like, I'll take some of that. You can send some of that 90 up our way. It, it, it's been in the 50s at night. So, ooh, ooh. yeah, yeah. Come on, send some of that this way. You know, I'll, I'll take all of it. I'll take a long Indian summer for certain. Now, you so, talked about coaching and things like that but i want i want to get a little little prior to coaching because i always like to ask former athletes what it was like during their recruiting phase so you coming from rock hill mm -hmm. where you were a running back you went to northwestern high school what made you choose to go to northwestern high school and then can you talk about why you chose to go to notre dame well, one of the things uh, it, coming out, I, I joke uh, with with people being in the recruiting process now and kind of understanding how how this whole process works. And uh, I didn't know I didn't know V to Notre Dame until January. And uh, so I joke with people. I'm like, man, I'm, I must have been a second or third choice because I, I didn't get my official visit until to January. But <laughs> it was uh, it was one of those things that we kind of I'm trying to tilt my head. It feels like my head's tilting somehow. Um, no, you're good. You look good. Well, one of the things that kind of uh, I I didn't, I'll be honest with you, growing up, I you grew up knowing about Clemson and at the time, Nebraska, you know, Georgia, Oklahoma, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to give you the credit and say Ohio State. So but I'm going to leave that one alone. <laughs> 
<laughs> but uh, you, 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 being in the South, you, you see those teams, especially at the time frame. Uh, Clemson had had been rolling pretty good, and uh, so I, I never really thought about Notre Dame until my senior year. And uh, once the recruiting started, I, I, to be honest with you, I had no clue that Notre Dame was recruiting me. To be honest, uh, you would get letters and things of like that. So you know how the, the recruiting, the letters and things, questionnaires yeah. and all those things. Uh, on my SAT, I, I, I know this for a fact. I, I, I definitely tried to send my my SAT score to Hawaii, but that I guess that didn't work. So I didn't get recruited by Hawaii. That was one of the teams I didn't get recruited by. Uh, <laughs> but um, as the process continued, just seeing – you know, just I, I only took two official visits. One was the University of Georgia. Um, I had been to Clemson at a summer camp before. I had been to South Carolina because it's only an hour away from my hometown. I had been to the University of South Carolina. Um, my, my third OB was supposed to be with uh, Penn State. And the thing that kind of made me uh, went to university is in my hometown. And I grew up working on campus, being around campus. And... Um, you know, once recruiting started, people started talking about Notre Dame and, and talking about the class they were putting together and, you know, all these these talented people. And it it was more so, to be honest with you, Marlon, it was, one, one, it was, a, it was kind of a, a challenge because I, I had a coach at the time for him, uh, mentioned that, you know, Notre Dame at the time was getting the, the top, you know, top guys. And basically told me that if I go to Notre Dame, that uh, I get lost in the shuffle and I never, I, I, I wouldn't be able to succeed. And I, so I, you know, being a young, uh, <laughs> young competitive kid, I was like, oh, well, let me find out about the school. And so right. from, from then on, it, it was like, OK, well, let me see Notre Dame is all about. And I started uh, following the history. And I was at first I was a little bummed about the fact that you couldn't have your name on the back of your jersey because I was prepared for that. <laughs> and uh, then uh, t uh, then I went on my official visit. Tony Rice was my host and Tony's from South Carolina. And he said, you know, if you sign here, I want you to wear number nine and uh, start a start a legacy at, at from uh, a pipeline from of South Carolina coming to Notre Dame and I you know you can't turn that down so I was like okay and I was uh, and I came back I, I went to Georgia first went to Notre Dame second and I got home and I told my mom I said I, th I think this is where I want to go and it was it was plain to say it was that easy and uh and the rest was history I guess I don't know if it's history but it was it was done <laughs> <laughs> It's crazy so, you mentioned so Jeff, Tony Rice. That was my idol. I wanted to be the next Tony Rice because I was going to go to Notre Dame. Um, but, yeah, you know, that that didn't happen. I'll have to tell you my recruiting story at some point in time. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Everyone, yeah, has, so, second, everyone has second choices. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, Jeff, I love having you on here. Now there's a little bit of, a little bit of shade going back the Buckeyes way. Tony Rice was my favorite player growing up as a kid. Uh, you know, my dad loved Notre Dame and – and uh, just watched the Tony and winning the national championship brought him so much joy. I was, I, I got the pleasure of meeting him at like a fan meet and greet back about 10 years ago now. And he was just all class, super, super nice. Listened to my story about my dad, humored me for five minutes. So I always appreciate that. And it's always nice, you know, when you meet people that you look up to as a kid and they, they end up become, being like you would want them to be. And you have a positive experience with, with guys. Speaking of positive experiences, Jeff, can you? We were talking with Marlon about like the game day experience of being a Buckeye. Can you tell people what it's like, like at, on campus for the game, like this weekend in Notre Dame? Like, what's it going to be like? And, and some of your memories of, of big games, you know, playing at Notre Dame. Well, I, before we get, I, I I've had had the fortune to, to go to not to a game, but uh, I was in Columbia. I went to Ohio State, and man, the the the, the atmosphere, the 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 campus itself is impressive. Um, but uh, so I was like, man, I, I wish we would have had a chance to play here. You know, like playing at Michigan, we we obviously we play in Michigan. But uh, I will I will do you credit and say the Ohio State uh, because I say the University of Notre Dame every time I, I speak of. Um, but I, I remember the the atmosphere is, is unlike to me, unlike any other. Um, I remember playing Florida State and uh, the one versus uh, two game and. I mean, fans were getting there. It started on, so I can imagine what is going on right now. Uh, I'm sure fans start pulling in on on Sunday night, uh, and and you know you're walking around campus and you're seeing all types of just 
like celebrities on celebrities uh, and you, you are you're you're collegiate athlete uh student athlete first and foremost so that's not we, we may be, be forgetting that considering what's going on with anyway that's another story that's a later <laughs> time for you guys to put me on um but you know you're walking around and you're seeing all these you know your fans i mean loyal fans that are on campus and they're there for one reason i mean and oh Notre Dame has their following, Ohio State has their following. It's going to be a madhouse. I mean, I can see the sidelines being packed with I mean, you. You you name it, there will be they will be at the game because uh, you know that the, the traditions of both schools carry a a, a lot of weight and uh, it means a great deal. So um, I I know those kids. I know the young men now uh, have seen so many people and doing so many interviews and. Uh, just nonstop, and I guarantee you, it started on Sunday night. After um, they probably got there Sunday afternoon, or some just stayed from from the game and just uh, <laughs> rented some rooms and just kept it for for the week. Do you um? Is it different as a coach? Like, what's a like a big game week for you now as a coach at Louisiana? How how is that different of an experience from being a college athlete than being an NFL guy playing in playoff games? Like. What's it now like as a coach during a week of a of a big game? Well, the the preparation is no different. You you're trying to make sure you're you're crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's, and uh, being detailed about things because at the end of the day, you don't want to do anything to hurt the kids from being successful, um, giving them the opportunity to be the best version of themselves that they can be. And did you did you cover this? You cover that? I mean, we. Uh, we've been fortunate enough around here. Uh, we've we've been successful. We we won um, we won the the Sun Belt Conference Championship two years ago. Um, we, we went on eleven. We we're eleven game winning streak, um, and we're we're getting back to that point right now. Uh, like I said before, our head coach is unbelievable. We got some we got some great talent uh, going into the game. The Sun Belt Conference itself is is tough. I mean, we you just saw. Um, South Alabama beat uh, Oklahoma State, so uh, our our conference is is nonstop. I mean, we App, App State beat um, was it A and M a couple years a couple years ago. So each year you you're playing talented teams, and this conference is only getting better with the uh, with the amount of great teams in it. So every week we got to be prepared. Um, you know, we want to be, we want to be the, the, the June 6th. We want to be uh, J- January 6th team to, to, to be the buster like Cincinnati did a couple of years ago. We want to be that team and we work for it every week and the game day atmosphere never changes this because you want to see the kids be successful, no matter what the situation is. Uh, we, we just left UAB a great environment. Um, we went to old dominion an unbelievable environment there. So it's, uh, Sports, sir. Uh, football is is always entertaining, and uh, these atmospheres never change. Do you worry? Did you do you worry more as a coach? <laughs> you more nervous before a game as a coach? Did you see? Do you see this? <laughs> <laughs> this is why I say don't mind off. <laughs> uh, it, it's uh, well, it's you you worry because, like you said, if 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 you're coaching for the right reasons, and most uh, all the most of the guys do. You you want you want to see these young men fulfill and and reach their goals and reach their full potentials, and I, I know for myself when even, even as a group, I mean we can get the win, but if your guys don't play well, it's still I mean yes, yeah, bittersweet because yes you got the win, but uh, you like to see the kids go out and, and do their best and play well. It's not a selfish thing. It's it's having those kids enjoy the. The moment completely and and that's what it's all about that's what collegiate sports is all about that's why we watch it that's why the fanfare that's why notre dame and ohio state brings a huge following because um you know you you get talented kids going out there playing at a high level and that that's what makes collegiate ath- athletics right now and I, i'm happy to be a part of it now you went to notre dame as a running back and then you made the switch so i'm going to ask two questions one okay I know Travis Hunter's not going to play for the next three weeks, but from somebody who has played on offense and defense at a high level in college, can you talk about that preparation, what it's like? And then when you made the switch from running back to just playing, I'm going to be a defensive back. Like, tell us that story, how that come about, 
what made you make the switch? Um, was it your choice? Was it your decision? Um, and, and kind of help us give us some insight on why you made that switch to go there. And it was ended up being a right switch because you know you got drafted here. We became good friends. No doubt, no all doubt. American <laughs> that way. But talk, tell, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, I tell you what, first and foremost, Mal, it's impressive what that kid's doing. I mean, I, I didn't play 160 plays. You know, I made some special teams plays and came in on some goal line situations. Uh, but that, that preparation each week is you have to know. I know from from the standpoint of me being a safety at the time frame and uh, Rick Miller being our defense defense coordinator, uh, just the volume of, of of knowledge you had to have of the defense alone, and being a safety, you have to make the calls, and then you have to have some uh, understanding of what you're doing from an offensive uh, standpoint. Although it was my my particular situation was a lot scaled down, but this kid is going in and playing. Uh, I mean, he's playing. He's legit playing offense and legit playing defense. And yes, you may playing corner. You, you got some coverages. You know, three, one, two, whatever it may be. However, you number those those those, those coverages. You still ha- there's still preparation of seeing what the opponent does and how they handle their business. And I tell you what, what that kid's doing is impressive. I, I mean, uh, you know, just thinking about back when I had that opportunity. I came in. I kind of, I kind of made the switch because out of, uh, I could have went into the spring and and split time and uh, earned a spot. I, I mean, I came in as a freshman. I was five A on the depth chart. I won't go. I won't go beyond. I, I'm gonna give myself a letter. I won't say. <laughs> I won't go beyond five. So I was five A on the depth chart, and I, I got some. I got some time in the backfield, um, and some and some games that we were fortunate enough to win big. Um, going into the spring, it was either start. At, at strong safety uh, or go back to go back to running back and, you know, compete for a job. And as a young kid, you just want to play. Uh, and that was me. I just I just wanted to get on the field. I mean, I, I played a lot of special teams. Uh, yeah, I could have. Uh, do I think I could have been a successful running back? Absolutely. No doubt in my mind. But I wanted to get on the field and contribute to what we had going on. And, you know, once I got on the field, the rest is history. I never looked back. Um, do I? Never had any concerns about going back to running back, but I did get the fulfillment of of, of playing it. Um, so that my sophomore year, when I made the transition, I was actually starting punt return as well. So that was my opportunity to get the ball in my hand. And then my junior and senior year, was I was blessed enough to play on the goal line situation. So my running, uh, me having the chance to run the ball, that was my fulfillment. Uh, those last three years, one as a punt return and the last two as a goal line uh, running back. And um, didn't think anything of it. And then I, I was blessed enough to get in the NFL and had some guys that did a heck of a job of, of protecting me as a punt returner. So I, I, I felt safe back there. My, my, my years there, oh, oh, Marlon and Ken taking care of me, had me locked in. So, um, you know, that's it's I can't imagine what that kid day looks like being pre- have preparation for each game because. I mean, you're talking 100. I think he had 168 snaps or something crazy like that. That's impressive. That is impressive. I I got a question for both of you guys here. Like, what for a game like this? You know, when when your team Jeff is playing a, a rival or you know a big name school, and then obviously for like a Notre Dame Ohio State game, as a as a college kid, like you guys both were. Did this did was did the week feel different to you guys than if you were playing you know just a just a generic opponent or you know not you know your rival or a big name school and maybe if, if it felt different did anything did you do anything differently like did you sleep more did you skip class <laughs> one day like was anything different as an athlete did you eat more did you eat less like like I think people would just want to know like as 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 players like how that had to be a long week. I'll let I'll let Marlon start first on that one. Uh, I can either confirm or deny on whether or not I cut classes or not, um, because my mom may be listening, so I won't say no. Um, I I think for me, I tried to make sure everything was the same. I I tried to take the same approach of no matter who the opponent was, but you know the magnitude of certain games, so you understand what what you have to do mentally um, and physically to be prepared to play. I think the funniest thing that I always laugh is um, because when I, when I work for the Bills, we used to always talk about, you could feel the pressure. I think, I think when it was a really big game, you could sense it more in the coaching staff. um, And that's where you had to try to like mentally say, okay, listen, 
they're going to be stressed out. Um, they're going to be a lot more harder in practice. They're going to not take a, a simple mistake. Like if you jump off sides, for example, um, if it's an Ohio State Notre Dame game, you run in laps. Like there's going to be some things that's going to happen that you might not have the same repercussions of if it was a team you know you're probably going to beat, like Western Kentucky last week that Ohio State faced, right? So, so things like that, understanding the magnitude that comes with the game is you have to kind of learn that as a player. But as far as the approach, like I tried to make sure everything I did was the same. I was trying to be a creature habit. That means I was going to go to bed at the same time. You're going to try to eat the, the same thing that you eat during the week. You're going to try to make sure you study at the same time so that you're always ready to go. I, and, and then I think with college and now some of the NFL games is, is the times change. So you kind of then have to mentally get prepared of, you know, is it a, is it a one o'clock game or a noon game or is it a seven o'clock game? Because that that also definitely changes how you approach when you're trying to get some sleep, what you're trying to do, how much prep time you have on a Saturday before the game. So just making sure you knew all that stuff. But I tried to be a creature of habit and do the same thing over and over. Well, it's kind of it's kind of funny that, you know, you mentioned a lot of that stuff because I, I guarantee you, you're still a creature habit with a lot of those things. We you we as student, we as athletes become routine. And I agree with Marlon from that standpoint. Same with us. And the one word that you mentioned is the mental preparation is the is the most important thing. I I, I remember like uh, Lou Holtz was he was always like those Florida, like I, I'm just speaking specifically for me, like when we were playing Michigan, we're playing Florida State, uh, that, you know, our practices were always hard. Um, the, the practices preparing for those games were always the same. Like, uh, and you knew the, like Marlon mentioned, the the level of, a, a level of concentration and focus at practice, the details really mattered. And the coaches tend to be, the, were on the edge more than the players. But as players, you knew, uh, you knew that, that, that everything picked up to the next level. And I, I just remember like whenever we played, you know, certain schools, like Lou was always a little more on edge when we played Penn State. I, I like he and Joe Pa was I, I I don't I don't know but he was always a little more on the edge when we played uh, Penn State. Um, you know he was confident. He, he was you know we were mentally prepared. Our practices were detailed, but we knew and and like like Ohio State like you we we can't we can't lose the game. You know if you lose a the game then you're you're not and it's not we're not we were not a part of the bowl uh, this this whole bowl having the bowls and all that stuff which we got cheated out of in 93 but it i won't get into that one uh we, we, got, it, we got into that I on agree, another show right jeff we we you guys are the undeclared national champions from 1993 okay yeah going to, exactly. go to my grave with that one <laughs> but but i do agree i do agree it's, it's more the coaches at that standpoint because we know um at that point it's it's a great opportunity uh for for these young men to go uh display uh, display at the highest level and guys that have aspirations of playing at the next level the first game they're going to watch are against these teams the elite teams the the ohio states uh you know the 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 alabamas the floridas the georgias all those teams that at the time were the elite teams because that's the first thing if you think you're a professional athlete i guarantee you there's at least four or five or six seven other guys or at the time frame would, would be on the field at the same time. I, I, I also, I recall us playing USC all the time. And, you know, it's funny because we used to make a big deal about the game. Like we knew, had to know the background, the history of, of, of the game while we're playing it, uh, who started the game. We had to take a test before we went out to ever play in the game, but we never, there was never any, we, we didn't worry about them. We, we, I'll, I'll just say we owned them for four years. Like we, I didn't lose the USC when I was at, and and they were just it was that type of. But we knew we had to be play at our at at our, at our best because they were talented. I mean, they number one picks overall. I mean, how many did they put out during that time frame? At, at least two or three, I think. And so, um, you know, you when you play that level of competition week in and week out, you have to be prepared mentally, and so your practice habits really they become like Marlon just said, they become routine and you try to make sure that you, you get to bed, you go to class, you do this, no, no outside distractions. You avoid, try to avoid the outside uh, distractions that, that take away from the most important thing. And that's winning the game. I'm going to turn my phone on. I'm going to turn my car on. So you may lose the video. 
just because yeah, no, my no, phone's we're dying. All good. We're all good. If you got like if you got like five more minutes for us, this is something I've I've been wanting to ask Marlon for a while. And we're kind of kind of the perfect guest to uh, to have on with him. As a DB, you give up a big play in a big game like this. How easy is it to shake it off and just go to the next play? I'll let you answer that one first. <laughs> um, <laughs> honestly, the the politically correct answer is is you're supposed to have a short memory. Um, I will say, I did not have a short memory at times, uh, and so I was always very hard on myself. What I was able to do was compartmentalize, um, so I could really put a plate kind of like mentally into a, a almost like a vault i could put it over here and be like i'm not gonna think about it um knowing that i needed to really go look at the play and figure out what i did wrong on that and i was gonna beat myself up when the game was over but it was just trying to make sure i had more pluses and minuses uh so for every everybody's different i just i learned when i got to the professional level that as long as i stayed emotionally even i didn't get too high i didn't get too low i was definitely a better player um, in college, I was definitely all over the board. I would get two up for games and not play great. I might not be that up for a game and have a great game. And it just took me a while to kind of figure out how to regulate my emotions to really play at a high level. And once I figured that out, then it was just, okay, that play doesn't matter. I can let it go. But early in my career, it was I was very hard on myself, and I took those plays to heart for a long time. Well, it, it was different for me because I was a safety in college my, my, my last two years. So all I had to do was close the middle of the field. If, 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 so I was the one helping in protection. And even if I didn't have an opportunity or if I gave up a play that, you know, if you're a man coverage, yes, you want to try to make sure. And we, we ran some, we had some zero pressures and things of that sort. So, but I had the luxury of, of, if it didn't happen on, on defense, I had the luxury of having an opportunity praying that we got down to the goal line to, to, to get in and, and re, just, you know, be an impact in other ways. So, um, you know, it, from the middle standpoint, like I said, being a, being a corner, especially being a corner in the big 10 and having to play the talent, uh, that they had to, but Marlon, you had Joy Galloway at practice, man. What did, you didn't have, how would you ever give up a play? Um, that guy, I mean, he's a, he's a four one. Four so, one. I had my, look. I had Joey. I had Terry. I had Chris Sanders. Uh, I mean, we had guys that could flat out burn. So I, giving up a deep ball wasn't more of a what they're gonna run by me. It was more of the did I bust the coverage right? Like like in cover three and they run trips and you have your trips two line. Do you carry like you're supposed to? And there's been game like a game where you're like, oh, I didn't care where I was supposed to. Things like that where you're like, I can't believe I gave up that play because we talked about it all week. And then I, I blew the coverage um, or cover two safety gets off the spot and they run at the go on the outside and you jam like you're supposed to. And you go to close on the on the, the route that's coming across the middle because that's what we talked about all week. And the safety lets the, the deep guy go. And you're like, I'm chasing the guy. Things like that where. You know, I, I remember that in the game, and, and Joey came up to me and was like, hey, man, stop chasing dudes when if they go deep on you. Like, stop. Like, it makes it look like you don't gave it up when I know you didn't give it up because I know y'all were in cover too, but you probably shouldn't chase people. And I'm laughing. Like, we won, we won that game. But things like that where, you know, you just kind of get out of position as corner. Uh, for me, it took me a lot. You know, you know, you talked about preparation. Dick Roach was probably the best defensive back coach that I ever came across. He might have been dry a doubt. and put you to sleep when he talked to you. But the yeah. level of preparation that he had you in and the, what he taught you in the detail, if I had learned that in college, oh, my goodness, it would have been night and day on my well, level of play from my freshman I, year. I, I, I'm going to cut you off, and I'm going I'm to pause for one second because you need to hear this. I, I, You coming in as a rookie, the reason we bonded so quickly, I thought, and this is just me talking to you, your level of play – your level of preparation, your level of football IQ at the time frame, I was I was blown away, blown away, technique, things of that sort. And I was like, God, this dude's a rookie. And you play with so much poise and confidence. And, and you know, I like I said, I, I, that's the one thing that I respected the most about you, that uh, going into games and how you took care of your business. So you needed to hear that. My, my pastor always would say, uh, 
people need to smell their roses while they can. And I, I've never told you that. And that's the most, that was the most impressive thing to me. I admired, I admired that in you. And, you know, that's the reason I respected you so much of seeing a young guy come in and do the things that you did, you, you and Ken. And uh, so that's, that's one of the things that impressed me more than anything. And I was like, golly, I, I got to pick my level of play up because <laughs> Man, I'll be sitting over here drinking a bunch of Gatorade if I don't come back from this ACL. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I mean, I will give you, I will give you some flowers back because you were the reason why I was trying to be that. I was like, I need to emulate somebody, and I wasn't. It wasn't gonna be Thomas. <laughs> That's a certain. It wasn't gonna be Smitty. So I was like, well, who am I gonna watch? I'm like, I'm watching film of you being patient at the line, jam. I'm like, okay, I need to figure out how to do that technique. <laughs> and so it's just amazing. And I knew you were from Notre Dame. I already knew who you were because, again, I, I was going to go to Notre Dame. So I had their player book. I had their whole oh, yeah. media guide. I learned everybody's number. I knew it all. So I knew you could play. I'm like, man, this dude can flat out play. So when I got there, I'm like, I'm just trying to be like you. I'm trying to emulate and imitate what you do. And Dick and his mirror and roll, I'm like, I thought you had the best mirror and roll <laughs> out of every car. I'm like, I got to get up and roll down like JB because he come up that thing like smoking. So it's just kind of right. crazy just how uh, – but I think that's the most important thing. Like why we still talk today is that we were able to come in and compete and push each other, but then no also doubt. find the fact that there's something in him that I want to emulate. And and if I can be like him and we can go and compete and let them make the decision, I don't really care. As long as I can get better every day, that was the only thing that really mattered the most to me was just getting better because I learned to love the game instead of yes. loving everything else that came from the game. I just wanted to be good at the game. I figured everything else would take care of itself. Well, I, I think that's even more so why this game this weekend is so important. And, and uh, game respects game. And I, I, you guys, the amount of talent you guys produce. I just mentioned Joey just to throw Joey's name out. But I played against Terry in the conference. Uh, so he was at New England. I was at Indianapolis. So at the time frame, you knew. I mean, shoot, you guys still putting out number one overall picks or whatever it may be, the receiver room, whatever. Uh, it, you you grew an admiration, a respectful uh, admiration of the guys, your opponents, uh, and you know I knew where you came from. I knew the school. I knew that I knew when you came in, you'll be prepared because of the talent level, and that's what this game is all about. This weekend, the talent that's going to be on the field is going to be incredible, regardless of who left that quarterback for Ohio State and uh, who's that quarterback for Notre Dame, and the the talent level of the two schools. Uh, is is what makes what makes this rivalry or uh, they, they should play every year. I, I think so. I, I mean, the two schools, Agreed. the three schools, yeah, Notre Dame should play Michigan. They should play Ohio State every year. And I watch the Ohio State Michigan game every year, like I went to Ohio State. Or uh, so you know, I won't tell you who I rooted for. No, I'm kidding. I'm joking. But I watch the game every year just because you know when you get those when you get those teams and the quality of programs that are that produce the talent that they produce is worth watching every week and i again that's that's why this game will be special this weekend so before uh before we let you go jeff you've been super generous with your time do you have a funny maryland story for us oh let me think about that <laughs> well i call him <laughs> but his nickname for me is short dog he knows that uh, oh okay Oh, uh, Marlon, you messing with the Wi-Fi right now? This is awfully convenient. Nope, not me. Not me. I had nothing to do with it. Well, so, oh, look so at that. Uh, Jeff, we, Jeff, we got a little bit. Wow, this is really well-typed. Jeff, we got some connection issues with you right now. Marlon, that's uh, you know, as the star of the show here, I'm calling shenanigans. I got the I got the laptop in front of me, but this is a little too convenient. Man, you know what can I say? I, I mean, you know, look at that. He froze, froze mid man. He froze mid story. <laughs> that's that's tough. Jeff, you back with us? Oh man, nope. that's tough. That's tough. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to have him back on to uh, to finish the story there. And I was gonna ask him for a prediction on the game, but I think obviously we probably know which side he'd be leaning. Uh, uh, I game. can tell you what side he's leaning leaning towards. I'm sure he's going to yeah. go with some golden domers. Sure. Sure. So, you know, what? we're going to, we're going to say goodbye to Jeff for now and, and thank him for his time. And uh, we'll get to, we'll get his prediction and I will absolutely tweet it out. Marilyn, if you can get his prediction and if you'd share the funny story that you just censored from uh, our, Oh, is he back? 
Uh, am I back? I made You're it. Back. Jeff, you know, okay. Marlon here, I think uh, I think he caused some communication issues because as soon as you started talking about a good story <laughs> about him, he went you went silent. So please uh, please continue and don't let Marlon censor you so, here, buddy. So they when uh so we, we used to have back when at the Bills, they didn't care about our weight. They were so – they was all about our body fat. And so we would have to get in the bipod. And so when – and when – when Marlon and Ken first got there, <laughs> you know, they weren't very happy with the bod plot. <laughs> so he and Ken both got into this. Now, Ken took it to the next level. But we we would go out and we would tell him about the rookie mill. And so Henry Jones was Henry Jones was coming along. And back then, we used to prank about, okay, we're going to take you guys to here, 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 and spend money. So – we went out to eat as as with those guys, and so he and Ken sit and they ordered like spaghetti and marinara sauce and chicken breast. <laughs> so, like so, Grill, and don't forget it was, so, it was grilled chicken breast. Grilled chicken breast. Yeah, yeah, I would go grilled chicken breast for sure, for sure. So they were so concerned about one, they didn't want they didn't want their quote unquote body fat to be over a certain level, but two was like, well. I'm certainly not gonna spend a lot of money because if we gotta pay a lot, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spend a lot. And so at the end of the day, we all ended up chipping into it. But they li- literally got chicken breast and like sp- spaghetti and marinara sauce, and didn't eat while everybody else was sitting like, oh, we were ordering whatever. And <laughs> but they were very cautious about what the, they were going there like, man. Yeah, I can't. This is not gonna be right, and so we took it easy on them. But it, it was funny just watching them prepare, just because one, they were just more concerned about okay, well, I, I gotta make a certain weight and body fat. Two, I gotta, I gotta spend a lot of money on this meal. So I'm gonna let you guys go ahead and eat, and we just gonna have this, and it'll be okay. So I'm sure he's still the same way. Uh, yeah, no, I'm not worried about the bob pot now. Uh, <laughs> okay. Oreo thins. That's my that's my thing. Oreo thins right now. That's uh, that's a great story, Jeff. Can you give us a prediction for Saturday night, and then uh, just a, a, like a small preview of the rest of your season uh, at Louisiana? I, I, I think it's going to be at home. I think we're going to win that thing by seven. I do. Nice. I think I, I think the running game is rolling right now. Sam is is spinning it well. It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard for those old Buckeyes coming in there, and the grass is going to be real hot. It's going to be nice and thick. Of course, it's going to be really thick, so that can make it slow, <laughs> like the, like New England used to be back in the day. I had that. <laughs> it's it's going to be nice and thick. So the ready game is going to be on, and Sam is going to be spinning. The defense is going to step up, and my man Free is going to be with the nice, cool. That, that's the thing. He's a linebacker from there, so you know he's hyped. So, so, so that's great. Yeah, does, does Audric estimate? Does Audric estimate remind you of Jerome Bettis? Does Audric estimate remind you of Jerome Bettis? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. We can't call him a, a small bus, but yeah, <laughs> he he definitely does. Definitely, He's so does. fun to watch. So fun to watch. So, uh, you know, we really appreciate your time, Jeff. You've been uh, you've been great. Good luck this weekend uh, yes, against UB. Weekend. Uh, people watching here might not share that sentiment, but you know, the two of us here <laughs> on the podcast definitely do. Hopefully, you guys have a great season, and I hope that people, you know, just follow along with Louisiana and the Raging Cajuns. They're they're really good. It's a good story. Good team. Good team to follow. Marlon, any uh, final thoughts here for Jeff? Nah, just thank you for coming on. I appreciate you taking time. I know I know how busy you are as a coach. Um, so I just thank you for taking time out of your busy day and schedule to hop on and chop it up and talk some memories about Notre Dame and 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 we'll see about that seven point victory. We shall see. Oh, all right. Well, I will definitely text you after the game. We'll, after after we win, I'll, I'll make sure I text you as well. Okay. Uh, I'll, put, I'll even put a, I'll put a Notre Dame hat on if you win. <laughs> all right, man. Oh, there, like we I, there we go. There we go. We can't say that. We can't say that because I'm not allowed to. So, yes. I got you. We'll, we'll figure out another way to do it. We'll figure out another way. <laughs> hey, maybe right, he, could buy you, he, could buy, he could buy you a chicken breast dinner. 
That's the deal. That's the deal. <laughs> spaghetti and grilled chicken, Uber Eats style. <laughs> well, 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 unfortunately, I, I, I'm a pescatarian now, so no, I, I only eat seafood. So it has to, it has to be some salmon. I'll take some salmon. Okay, no I'll send some salmon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sounds good. Take All care, right, you guys. Take care. You All too. Right. Bye bye. Bye. Oh man, that was a lot of fun. He uh, he's a he's a great sport, and and I mean, great coach. They're they're doing really well there, and. You know, that's yes, really that's really nice of him to, to come in on a you know on a game week and and spend some time with us. Absolutely. So um, yeah. So <laughs> it, it's funny how you like you you get stories after you get a little older, um, and he's like, I thought you were prepared. I'm like, I thought he was well prepared. I'm trying to emulate my game after him and what he does. So, um, but we had a great room with just myself, uh, Ken Irvin coming in in that '95 class with Ruben Brown. Todd Collins, Damian Herring, uh, Damian Covington. Uh, and so we had really had just a really good recruiting class that class that year. Uh, and then getting into that room with Henry Jones and Kurt Schultz and, and Matt Darby. Uh, and we had Greg Evans uh, and there just as the safeties and then Manny Martin coming. Uh, and it was just a really good room just to kind of figure out how to play the game of football. Uh, and we were deep. We could match up with anybody. Um, so when teams, when, when, when Indianapolis Colts was in the AFC East and they would go four wides, we could put four corners and match up against them. So it was just one of the coolest experiences uh, that you could got to see and just, and I played um, early. And so there was some really good people to emulate and, and pattern my game after. And Jeff was one of them. Yeah, that was high praise. That was high praise for him. If it makes you feel any better, you were my first pick for a podcast partner too. So, you know, from your appearance on If the Walls Could Talk in Buffalo, I could see well, your I potential. I the confidence. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it wasn't only the Bills brass and it wasn't only, you know, uh, John Butler drafting you. But uh, when I was, you know, thinking about doing this, you were clearly my first choice, too. So, you know, my extensive uh, podcast experience of one year uh, made you the clear choice. Before we go here, we're, we're running up against the hour mark here. Before we go, you got a, another game you're looking forward to as kind of an appetizer for uh, Saturday night? I mean, besides that, I mean, there's really no game besides Ohio State Notre Dame, really. But, you know, um, I'm really looking forward to kind of seeing what what's going to happen here in a couple of weeks when when Colorado gets together. I, you know, we didn't get a chance to talk about it, but I had to put this up, you know, because, okay. you know, I mean, who <laughs> as a coach, who does that? Like, how do you become and put bulletin board material up as a coach? Like, you, you know, you don't talk about that. Uh, and this game had so much drama so much everything and then when you're all said and done you know you come back and i have to bring out my shade like, <laughs> that, oh like, there's the let there's me get the ready with it. like come on like i'm ready to go like you know if i had time i'd, I'd put on all my chains over here too because I, I had them ready to go <laughs> i was like let me be like dion but the game was amazing uh, and i was definitely up until 2 a.m watching it and you know it, it reminded me of so much of just their mindset. You know, Jeff talked about the attention to detail that it takes to play at a high level. Um, this is a rivalry game. You know, you you never want to be the one to give bulletin board comments. And then all of a sudden, Colorado finds themselves down. Uh, and then Shador just leads the drive. And it's fitting that a Colorado team yeah. will go on another 98-yard drive. I love no that. way. Uh, and I'm sitting there thinking, like, I, I was a kid cheering that on because I was a Broncos fan, believe it or not, in in Ohio. Cleveland Browns fans, please don't hate me. Oh. Uh, but when I think about those things, I mean, the 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 way he moved the pocket um, and, and used his legs to get out and escape and do some things, the so throws that he made, uh, and then just being able to read it and, and do some things at the end of the game, he always keeps his composure. He never seems to be rattled. Uh, and so I know he's second in the, in the nation in passing uh, behind – Washington's quarterback, uh, Penix, Michael Penix Jr., uh, but he is putting on a clinic uh, on how to throw the ball and stay poised. And so I'm just excited to see what they're going to do. I believe they have Oregon in a couple weeks. They're, they're at Oregon this week. At and Oregon then this next, week. And then, believe it or not, next week, they just announced today they're playing USC at home. Yeah. And it's going to be the big noon kickoff on Fox. That game's going to be Whoa. 10 in the morning. 10 in the morning in Boulder, Colorado in two weeks. So that's going to be they, crazy. That's going to be fun to watch for certain. That's going to absolutely. So hopefully everybody enjoyed this episode. Please like and subscribe. It really helps us uh, on our show, on the YouTube algorithm. It helps us, uh, you know, grow and and, and sustain our audience. Uh, the cover one uh, team and their one pass is something to certainly take a look at uh, with the Bills, you know, season going. And, and those guys give absolutely top-notch Bills coverage. And uh, Marlon, give me uh, give me your prediction here. I, I think I already know. 
I try not to give scores. Um, what I'll sure. say is, is I think Ohio State wins this game if they can do a couple things. If they can get McCord in the rhythm early uh, and make it make some easy throws for him, if they can get their playmakers involved really early in this game, you're talking about the number three and number four yards per game defenses so far. Ohio State is third in the nation, only giving up 223 yards a game. And then you've got Notre Dame giving up 234 yards a game. Uh, so it's going to be who can break. If we can stop the run. Uh, and then Sam Hartman, we know he can play. We know he can spin it. Um, but if we can get up early, I want to see how he responds. If we can get up early and make it difficult for him. And we need to control the line of scrimmage and own the time of possession. Ohio State has yet to win the time of possession battle in either of their games. And I know that's partly due to the rules and the clock change. But if they can do those things, they have a really good chance to win this game in Notre Dame. Hostile environment. Um, if you can get up early and take the crowd out of it, you can steamroll because they have position. They have talent at every position. Home run hitters in, in their running backs. Home run hitters in their receiving core. Um, you just got to be smart. Don't turn the ball over. Don't give up the big play on the defensive side. And then we can see who wins. If, if, if Notre Dame can be methodical or not, um, then we'll see. So I still like Ohio State's chances. I think they are a really good team. I think they're playing well. Um, I definitely say, I, I don't know about the seven point win, like Jeff said, um, but I would, I would like, I, I, I could see a 27, 24 victory, 31, 27 style game for Ohio State. Okay. I was going to go the exact flip of that go 31, 27 Notre Dame. I can predict that I will be, um, Really excited for the game. I can predict that I will be here next Tuesday at 3 o'clock with our next show, win or lose. Touchdown Jesus will still be behind me. My dad's lucky hat, rest in peace, My his Notre Dame hat, I busted out from the closet. So we're going to wake up the echoes. And like Jeff said, the grass is going to be really long at Notre Dame Stadium. And then I hope everybody, hope everybody enjoys the game. And I hope next week uh, Marlon will be uh, maybe uh, wearing a little bit of green. <laughs> I won't put it in the dream. I might be a little sad, but but I love these type of games because win or lose, you can still run the table and have a chance to still get back sure. into the possible playoffs. And you need you need games like this. You're going to have two top ten opponents uh, getting ready to go at each other, and that's what it's all about. Take the chance, take the risk, go play some top notch talent. Win or lose, use that as a measuring stick. Get better. And then at the end of the day, the still the still goal is to beat that team up north and win the Big Ten East. And you still have the opportunity to do that, whether you win or lose this game. Go Irish. Go Buckeyes. <laughs>